Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Kim Beer. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. And we are thrilled to welcome you to our Home and Community-Based Services webinar. We're thrilled to have our guest speaker. Uh, our, the title of our webinar is What Are They and Why Are They Important? Um, I would like to uh, thank you so much for joining us. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce our webinar presenter and cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we, we received enormous turnout for this webinar, so we are thrilled that so many of you are interested in this very, very important topic. Nicole Jorwick is the Senior Director of Public Policy at The ARC, a national community-based organization advocating for and serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Prior to joining the ARC policy team, Nicole served as Senior Policy Advisor for the state of Illinois. And prior to that appointment, Nicole served as the CEO president of the Institute on Public Policy for People with Disabilities, where she continued the Institute's mission to improve the lives of people with disabilities and assisted the leadership of the state of Illinois in developing public policy driven best practices in serving individuals with disabilities. She is an accomplished special education attorney and advocate for students with disabilities with a focus on tra transition aged youth. Nicole received her JD and Child and Family Law Certificate from Loyola University Chicago. She also received her BS from the University of Illinois. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. Closed captioning is available for this webinar. Please click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen to access it. If you have any questions for Nicole, we'll be doing our best to monitor, monitor them during the, the webinar. Uh, please enter them into the Q&A box. We'll have time to answer questions at the end. And as we put in the chat box, we will have a recording of this webinar and it will be available on our uh, Reef Foundation's YouTube channel. We're thrilled to have Nicole on um, Nicole. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and I'm so glad to be joining you all um, on this really important topic around Medicaid, home and community-based services or HCBS. Um, I'm gonna give kind of a, a little bit of background on the issue and then talk about some current events that are occurring, which is why it's really important that everybody has the information that they need about this important topic. Um, first, I think it's important to kind of uh, center myself and how, how I got into this field and why um, these home and community-based services matter to me. Um, the person that is in the picture that I'm also in is my brother, Chris. Um, he is 31 and has autism and receives Medicaid home and community-based services in Illinois. Um, but he actually wasn't my first connection to disability. Before my brother was even born, um, the other person in, in this on the slide is my friend Sam, um, and we were in the first included classroom uh, in our school district a long, long time ago. Um, and so I've been really lucky um, that disability has been part of the fabric of my life, which is why community integration and making sure that all people with disabilities, no matter their needs, um, have access to supports in their home and community is so important to me because I know how it benefited my life to, to have people with disabilities included. Um, and so I'm here to talk about um, really the main game in town when it comes to supporting people with disabilities to live in their home community. It's really important that we think about the historical perspective on how people with disabilities have been treated and um, uh, and handled. Um, society really didn't see people with disabilities um, as uh, deserving or able to directly participate in society, but obviously, thankfully, that has changed over the years. Um, it's shifted from a, a care model or a medical model of disability to an empowerment model to how are we supporting um, integration. And we know that there has been a huge historic over-reliance on large congregate settings and a huge over-reliance on unpaid family caregivers, and that remains. Um, and the reason that a lot of that is, is, be, is because we need to invest in the alternative to those large nursing and in, nursing facilities and institutions um, and provide more access to what will, what will provide support to family caregivers. And that is um, Medicaid home and community-based services. Um, families, uh, and most importantly, led by individuals with disabilities themselves, started to talk about how do we make sure that the services exist so that um, the only option isn't an institution or, um, or relying on that family caregiving? And 
as I'm going to talk about Medicaid is what funds those services. And what Medicaid is, frankly, is pretty complicated. Um, and that's not because it's not a great program. It's because it's a program that's complex. It's a program that is called different things in different states. Um, and that's because Medicaid fundamentally um, is a lot more than just a healthcare program. Um, one in five people rely on Medicaid for healthcare. Um, it's, it's around 75 million people as of last June. Um, over 11 million people with disabilities rely on it for that basic health care, but also for the services that they need in order to live independently. So as I said, it's a lot more than a health care program. It's the main funder. So it's really, I, I always say, the main game in town when it comes to funding those supports and services. Medicare um, does not provide any sort of um, funding for long-term services and supports outside of a short-term rehabilitation stay. And so for anybody who needs these services, um, they're typically gonna go through Medicaid or be private pay, which is obviously exorbitantly expensive. And so um, Medicaid funds healthcare, but it also includes long-term services and supports, which is the umbrella term that includes both the institutional side of um, long-term services and support. So nursing facilities, institutions, because a lot of people don't realize, but there are still 36 states that have institutions open where people with disabilities are. Um, and um, also the other side of that is home and community-based services. So LTSS is the umbrella term and HCBS is, are those home and community-based services. And why this matters and why it's really important to understand is because this program is constantly being looked at, constantly not receiving the investment that it needs. Um, and it's that threat comes in particular for people with disabilities because while people with disabilities and older adults only make up about 21 to 23 percent of Medicaid beneficiaries, they account for about 48 percent of the cost. And that is because of the high cost and obviously long-term need for these supports and services. And so we have to be particularly diligent um, in advocating and making sure that legislators and others understand why these supports and services are so important. What are home and community-based services? Um, it's really anything that assists with independent living. In the home, it can be assistance with cooking, assistance with medication, self-care, personal hygiene, budgeting, um, socialization, community integration. It can be anything from, there's a lot, a lot of people don't realize how many uh, employment supports, job coaching, that sort of thing are also funded um, by home and community-based services through Medicaid. It's not just um, vocational rehabilitation. Um, Medicaid, as I said, is complicated and a lot of that is fundamentally because it is a state and federal partnership. Um, the federal government has the federal, we have the federal Medicaid law, um, but who runs the program, who implements the program, that's at the state level, which is why it can be called different things in different states. It's 10 care in Tennessee, it's Badger care in Wisconsin, and that's what makes it really complicated. Um, but it is also, it's how it works. And the federal law, um, so again, that's where it comes from the top, is what sets what are mandatory required services under the Medicaid program and what are optional services. Mandatory services include the traditional healthcare, doctor visits, emergency room, that sort of thing, prescription drugs, um, nursing facilities, as well as, I, as I said, in those 36 states that still have institutions, those are mandatory. Whereas optional services, though they of course are not optional to the people who need them, are, are home and community-based services. And why that matters is when there, there is any particular threat to this program, the states don't have any choice about what they have to continue to provide. Um, because that is under the federal law, what is mandatory. And so the first place that cuts come are to those optional services. How mandatory and optional services also shows up in, in a really concrete way is in waiting lists. Um, there are, um, according to Kaiser, 820,000, although many people suspect that it's many more um, individuals on waiting lists for these services. There can be waiting lists because they are optional services. Because they're optional services, states can put a cap on how many people they're serving in any particular um, service funding stream. So um, 
this is something I'm explaining for a reason as that, that, I, that will be clearer as we move through, but this is just a fundamental, what we call the institutional bias in the Medicaid program. The Medicaid program was created in 1965, so it needs to be modernized. Um, the home and community-based service funding stream is, is relatively young. It's only, it was created in 1981. And so we need to make sure that we're taking a look at how do we um, make sure that there's access um, to um, the services. And I've, I've seen the questions in the chat around, or around the slides being available and the recording be, being available and the answer to both is yes. So um, just jumping in there since I saw them. Um, so that's a little bit more about kind of the basic structure of Medicaid. Um, and really the focus has been on home and community-based services because we saw how important those services are because as I said, they're really the alternative to what we saw um, being particularly dangerous in the last year. A lot of the work it seems like might be flowing um, directly out of COVID, but it actually, a lot of the groundwork started a long time ago. It actually started 40 years ago when the first waivers were created for Medicaid home and community-based services, uh, the Katie Beckett waivers. And uh, because as that long ago, the ARC has had it on the agenda to make those services um, a mandatory service. But in recent years, there has been even more of a reason that we've really been focusing on education of legislators around, that, around Medicaid and specifically home and community-based services. Um, in 2017, Folks might recall that there was a that there were proposals to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act, um, or um, also sometimes known as Obamacare, and um, that the Affordable Care Act has many important provisions for people with disabilities um, around non-discrimination. But what was particularly troubling was that the way that it was going to be paid for were um, proposed cuts to Medicaid that were up to a trillion dollars over ten years. Why that's particularly problematic is because of what I just explained about the fact that when those cuts come down, the first place that those cuts go is to optional services because states don't have a choice um, on what's mandatory or what's optional. So we heard state uh, Medicaid agencies talking about eliminating entire supported employment programs. We even heard talk about um, states having to eliminate their whole HCBS program altogether because of the size of those cuts that were being contemplated. Um, during that time, the disability community really banded together um, to make sure that, that people with disabilities and their stories were being told. But actually, we also learned that we needed to do a lot of education within our own constituency because of some of that complexity that I talked about. I can't tell you how many phone calls I got in 2017 that would say, oh, no, no, I, I'm, I don't get Medicaid. I'm on a waiver service. Well, it's a Medicaid waiver. Or, oh, no, no, I'm on... Um, Pen care, or I'm on um, something else. And so, and that's not to insult anyone that didn't understand, it's a complicated program. But we learned that we had to educate our own constituency, and we also certainly had to educate members of Congress. Um, I remember during that summer being at an event where we were celebrating an anniversary, a birthday of the Medicaid and Medicare program, and the, the two programs were mixed up by legislators. That's happening a lot less now. And a lot of that is because so many people have been willing to talk about these services and why they matter to their life. Um, so while that threat was, um, it, was it didn't feel short, but it was, it was short-lived, it was about nine months. Um, and we uh, really showed our force, but also knew that we needed to be vigilant. Um, these are just some pictures of, we, we led some letter writing campaigns. So even people who couldn't get to DC had the opportunity to share their stories and, um, that led us, once that immediate threat was over, um, we had, during that fight, disability community tends to um, uh, operate in kind of echo chambers. All the disability community talks to each other and that's great, but we don't always get outside of that. And because of the really big threats that were happening in 2017, um, we were able to get into spaces where we might not have been before. And so I wanna be really clear, the ARC does not take any official position on any sort of universal health care proposal, but before 2018 um, or 2019, 2019, 
none of the proposals um, included any sort of long-term services and supports. And we started have, having conversations saying, if you're looking at, at healthcare reform broadly, you can't think about just traditional healthcare. You also have to think about the long-term services and supports. So I'm proud and frankly shocked to say that now all of the universal healthcare proposals, including the, the public option bill, which is Medicare for America, includes um, LT, home and community-based services. Uh, and so that's just gonna be helpful because you know, kind of in the concept of rising tides, lift, lift all ships. We don't know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some specific HCBS funding that's coming, but it's also very likely that healthcare reform might become part of it. So there's gonna be a bunch of places where you might see CBS advances hooked in. And so I just kind of want to make sure that that I'm showing the history, but also to, so that you and can anticipate when different advocacy points may be. So obviously during um, 2020 and even really the first quarter and, and it continues, um, COVID-19 took all the attention and really exposed the cracks in the system that people with disabilities and advocates have known for decades. The, da the inherent danger um, data or out the inherent danger of those large congregate settings, um, the, the over-reliance on, on unpaid family caregivers, um, and just the, the, the risk, the public health risks that were out there. Um, this is just a bit of a bit of a background, um, but we knew from the very beginning that people with disabilities and or those who were immunocompromised were gonna be at particular risk and have more dis difficulty isolating. Um, before I shift to the 117th Congress, I have to talk about the 116th, the end of the 116th, which was um, the Congress that was in place until um, early January of this year. Um, the disability community pushed um, for some dedicated funding to support those Medicaid home and community based services because um, advocates knew that uh, this, the stress more people losing their employer sponsored insurance and needing Medicaid coverage for basic health care would lead to um, growing roles in Medicaid and that that could lead to some cuts to services. And so we had been pushing for dedicated funding. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't until um, March of this year that we finally got that. So the American Rescue Plan that passed, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act is the first bill that passed in the 117th Congress. So that's the Congress that came in in January. And that finally did include a 10% FMAP bump. So an FMAP bump is a federal matching assistance percentage. And it's that is the amount of um, the match. So I talked about the state and federal partnership. A state knows if, if they put in a dollar to fund Medicaid, that they are going to get a that FMAP, that percentage that match back from the federal government. In every um, state, it is over 50%. New York and California, it's like 50.01, but it's still over 50%. Um, it varies from 50% to 75%, depending on where you are. But this would be an additional 10% on top of that. So if you were already getting back 50 cents, this would be an additional 60 cents to support specifically Medicaid home and community-based services. This was a total of $12.7 billion to strengthen and expand access to Medicaid home and community-based services um, and for one year of funding. So this is really great, but I've really been equating this funding as fu money that should have passed in March of 2020. Um, and so the, the fact that we got it is great, but it's really to fill in holes in, in a sinking ship. Um, the, the service system has been stressed um, a lot of programming still isn't open, that we still do not have enough staff. And so it's really helpful, but it's not enough. And so luckily, um, about 20 days later, um, President Biden um, announced the American Jobs Plan. And that's, if you've been following in the news, that's really what's, what's the infrastructure package, the more kind of traditional roads, bridges, but also included in this was a $400 billion investment in Medicaid home and community-based services, which is frankly the 12.7 billion was unprecedented. This is like unprecedented times, whatever it, whatever that is divided by 12.7. Uh, it is meant to address um, access to services. So include addressing um, providing services for folks on the waiting list, 
also meant to address the direct care worker wages and the, the direct care worker crisis. So to create better um, direct care jobs and to create more of those jobs, because in order to expand access, you also have to have the workforce to provide those services. So $400 million is a lot of money. Um, it's being dis what's being discussed on the Hill right now is kind of how to operationalize that proposal. Um, and we should expect to see things coming out soon. What we do know is that um, there, there is this momentum and focus on home and community-based services because of how many people have been willing to share their stories and talk about it. I mean, I can name any data point or dollar amount, but it really is the stories that makes the difference with legislators. Um, and even though it can be hard, and I know as a family member, it can be hard to share um, some of those things, but it really has made all the difference. And I think is why we have this really unique moment in time to get, um, get something through. We know too that the public is behind it. Um, Data for Progress, which is a polling firm put out polling in the middle of May that showed that actually this HCBS funding hold better than any other part of the infrastructure bill um, in 10 key battleground states. And that's really important because we know that while $400 billion is a lot, it's not enough to get get to a system where everybody is served and that's gonna that's gonna remain a, a long-term goal. So I, I wanna kind of make sure that I'm really clear. $12.7 billion already passed. That's the law that passed in March. What we're gonna be pushing for as an advocacy community between now, the end of September, although now we're hearing more the end of this year, which I'm still trying to process personally, um, <laughs> that this could go till the end of the year, but it means there's gonna be lots of opportunities to advocate. And that $400 billion is gonna be a bridge, pun intended, to what our ultimate goal is, which is to make, to change that institutional bias in the Medicaid program, to make sure that we put home and community-based services on equal footing with those institutional services so that all people who want, want home and community-based services have access. And March was a really big month, um, and which frankly makes it all confusing, which is part of why I'm trying to be really clear about this year, we're focusing on the 400, but our long-term goal is going to be a bill called the HCBS Access Act. Um, that's a bill that would fundamentally, as I said, um, it would make home and community-based services a mandatory service under the Medicaid program. That would obviously then eliminate waiting lists because if a service is mandatory, you can't put a cap on it. It would also set a federal floor for services. So if you're in one state A, you would know that state B has those same services. That's not the case now. Between waiting lists and also states offering different sets of services, it means that a lot of people who receive those services can't move from one state to the other without being worried about losing their services. Um, and so that's, we call that portability. So this would fundamentally assist with Medicaid portability. HAA or the HCBS Access Act also would have increased funding to make sure that we're addressing the wage, um, wage disparities in, um, for the direct care workforce. Um, the national average wage for the direct care workforce is less than $11 an hour, which is um, part of why there's so much turnover. And this is work that's um, very incredibly important. So the HCBS Access Act, as I said, is our long-term goal, um, but we have, um, a lot more to do in order to get to recovery. And so I'm gonna go back to the immediate, which is our recovery priorities. Now, these are the ARCS recovery priorities. I'm not saying that, that these are um, the Reed Foundation's priorities, but I just figured I'd share them for context. Obviously our number one priority is around um, that $400 billion investment. And what's really clear and what was really clear in um, President Biden's proposal for the American Jobs Plan is that this funding needed to go to both expanding access to services and um, also addressing the workforce issues. So we, we know that in addition to supporting um, individuals who are receiving services, that will allow people with disabilities who want to work because they have those services. It will also allow, allow family caregivers who are filling in the gaps in those services to return to the workforce if they choose to. And then we have um, some of our proposals around paid leave and improvements in SSI because there's pretty stringent and outdated income and asset limits. And so I already talked about this and this is really what I've been saying to anywhere that I've been talking about this, um, which is 
as many places as I can because it's so important. And as I said, we have this really important moment in time is that it's really important for folks to share your story and not just with legislators. Um, I know uh, as a family member, I'm from a huge family um, and, a, and it wasn't until I started doing this work that I even tried to make sure that all members of my family understood what services my brother got, how they're funded um, and why they matter. And they know them why they matter part, right? Because they're, they're part of his life, but it's important that we as individuals who might be in, um, individually receiving the services or have family members who do understand why they're important so that we can um, make sure that our family members understand why they're important and that ultimately that can lead to um, advocacy to support expansion of these services. Um, and so that's really our focus so that we can get to that 400, we can get that $400 billion over the finish line. Um, and uh, I put the ARCS uh, Action Center up there. We have a story collection tool. We also have our action alerts that include those three priorities that were already listed. My email's there too if folks have any questions. And I know that I see that there's some questions, so I will stop talking. And please feel free to also enter questions in as we're as we keep going. I'm here to here to answer anything that you have. Nicole, on behalf of the Reef Foundation and everyone attending, I want to say that that was the most efficient and informative presentation under 30 minutes around a Medicaid program that I've ever heard. So we are very, very grateful. And I know we jumped right into the presentation. I want to add too that the Reef Foundation is a proud member of many coalitions that the ARC is also a member of, and we want to sincerely thank you on behalf of the Reef Foundation for all your efforts to lead, uh, lead us and other disability organizations interested in, in fortifying this program, both monetarily, but also educating, in us, educating us on how we can improve it. So the Reef Foundation has learned a lot from you and the ARC in the past year, especially uh, at the onset of the pandemic. And we, we commit ourselves to support, continuing to support your work as well as that of the coalition. So for those attending, I just wanna reiterate that we are all working together. And again, we, we wanted to invite um, the expert to really, really address us. So I, I, again, I just wanna say thank you. I, I, we have a bunch of questions here, yeah. let's see. Um, do the proposals include long-term care? Um, um, so long-term care is, is, a, is a term that we don't use as much anymore. Yeah. Um, long-term care is the, the, um, the term, the term that has taken over long-term care is long-term service and supports. So long-term care is included, um, because HCBS is part of what the umbrella term that now, um, but if, you, if what you mean by long-term care is institutional care, um, like nursing facilities, et cetera, that's not gonna be part of the $400 billion because this $400 billion is specifically for um, uh, home and community-based services. However, there are certainly plenty of groups and the ARC is part of some of those conversations around how to make improvements because obviously there are people who are currently receiving services in um, skilled, skilled nursing, et cetera. So we don't wanna just like leave that completely out, but that $400 billion is specifically for HCBS. Got it. That that price tag for long term services would be much larger, correct? For, um, um, long -term, maybe, for long term care. Yeah, I mean it would be because yeah. right, yeah. But um, it's still a very important issue for our organizations as well. We have another question that says, "Do you have a list by state of other programs that are available to people who are eligible for a HCBS program and are on a waiting list um, that they could qualify for in the meantime to assist until they come up?" on the waiting list. For example, this attendee has a client that is on a waiting list for the STAR program in Texas, but we were, but we were able to gain eligibility on another community care program that the state of Texas has. Yeah, so the, the, the program that you're talking about is the community first choice option. That's what Texas has. And what, what the community first choice option does, and it was actually, it may, became law under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it, it provides an enhanced, so I talked about that match, it in, in provides an enhanced 6% to states to provide some limited services to people on the waiting list. So that would be that community care program. Um, and so there's only six states that do it. It's, let's see, I'll, I don't think I'm gonna remember them all, but I'll try. Um, Texas, Maryland, 
um, Montana, Connecticut, California, and Oregon. It's pretty good. Good job. Uh, but uh, and I, it's part. I'm that's. You know, I think that there's that's something that we're thinking about how we could maybe work on to include in that four hundred billion dollars. Is how is there a way we can give a really limited service to everyone? while we're building towards that ultimate goal of making all HCBS. So that's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, so, but, the, but that's the, those are the six states that have that program. Um, great, thank you. Um, I saw another one here, let's see. Um, are you looking at the HCBS having to be self-directed? I find that many families are overwhelmed with the prospect of managing staff. Will community providers who are fully person-centered be able to work with HCBS to relieve the burden for the families? Yeah, so self-direction is a model where, where individuals can direct their own services, hire, fire, um, and do that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean that, um, because and self-direction is something that's growing, but that doesn't mean instead of, or to completely replace um, provider, uh, provider-driven models. I certainly, I mean, that's the model that our family uses um, it helps with some case management and other things like that. And so definitely that, that does not mean that, um, that uh, it's gonna be completely replacing provider. Uh, Cause I certainly understand that not, not every individual or family wants to take that on. Um, we still have some more, do you still have time? For some yeah. more questions? Okay, great. Uh, what about states that are bent on not providing services and have declined waivers? I think this person says like Texas, wait lists are literally decades long. Is there a national effort to get them on board? <clears throat> to get them on board? Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand what that is, um, what that means. So, yeah, I mean, so I recognize- oh, oh, I maybe the people on a waiting list? I, I'm not sure because it's all state decide, it's all state um, operated, right? Yeah. So yeah. So that's what the HCBS Access Act would handle directly, um, because the um, because in states like Texas and also my home state of Illinois has twenty thousand people on the waiting list that can be up to a decade. Um, Texas definitely has a much larger one, but um, because states have sort of been kind of building two tiered systems, right? They've been continuing to fund the institutional side without being able to put enough investment into the HCBS side. Um, the HCBS Access Act would require HCBS, so that would eliminate waiting lists, but it also would provide states 100%, so 100% federal dollars to move. Mm -hmm. So we know that some states are gonna need a lot of support, which is why that additional funding would be there. And that's what would get people with the, um, people off of waiting lists, even in places like Texas where they're so long. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, thank you. What we have another question. What happens if your state and governor dissolved and denied our FMAP? Uh, what happens? I don't, um, I don't know what state that mean that is. So you might be talking about the you're, you might be talking about the American Rescue Plan um, Act funding that was the 12, the ten percent FMAP bump and in some governors in in state Medicaid offices talked about not taking it up. Because right now, everything that's being discussed, um, the rescue plan and, and likely what's going to happen with the American jobs is happening in this really partisan process called um, the budget reconciliation. And so far, though, what I will say is that that has not been true. Even states, I know I had heard, we had heard rumors that Idaho, for example, wasn't going to take it up. And when push came to shove, they did take it. Because the reality is, is that um, states aren't going to give up additional federal money um, to support things. At least that's what we're seeing so far. What, but, if, but if a state did choose to do that, unfortunately, um, there's not too, I mean, on the, on the ground advocates should obviously be, you know, raising heck and talking to the media of why, you know, why you mm -hmm. wouldn't take additional funding, but there's nothing that can be done to kind of counteract that at the federal level, except unless a law can be, but um, we see, I have a couple questions asking about how area agencies on aging or the aging community and the disability communities working together on this issue. Yeah, um, great question and important question. And we're working a lot together. Um, 
uh, Kim and I are in several coalitions. One of them is the Dis Disability and Aging Collaborative. Um, and that's a collaborative that I co-chair with um, a colleague from the National Council on Aging. Um, and so we're, we're, we're really working in lockstep um, because we know, for example, that AARP has data that shows that 90% of aging adults want to want to age in place, want to stay home. And so we're making, we're working with them to make sure that, that um, our coalition can stay broad and that we can work together. We're also working right now because this funding is um, so workforce focused. We're working a lot with our colleagues um, in labor um, because mm -hmm. obviously they have a, a component of, as, of it as well. And that's part of what feeds into my optimism about the moment is that we're, we don't always talk to each other. We don't always um, work in tandem on these issues, but we really have been um, all during COVID, but even really starting in mm -hmm. 2017 and before. So uh, we're definitely working with them. Um, um, and there's a lot of aging groups that are part of disability, uh, DAC. And if I start listing them, I'll forget mm -hmm. someone and feel bad, but that's a really important point and it's something that we're really cognizant of. Great, thank you. I see some additional questions around um, care, family caregivers and spousal pay and are, are any of those components included yeah. in either the guidance or the legislation? Yeah, so I mean, some of that remains to be seen, right? Because they're still developing the legislation. What I will say is that um, the two policy proposals that were included in what because President Biden really just put out very general language about $400 billion and um, to support workforce and services. That was kind of it, but he did include some specific legislation. One is the Money Follows the Person program, making that permanent. That is a program that um, has moved over 105,000 individuals with disabilities and aging adults out of institutions and into the community. It also shows savings. It shows a 20, 22% Medicaid beneficiary um, savings per month and also better outcomes and also spousal impoverishment protection. What that, that component does is make sure that if, one of, if your spouse becomes in need of home and community-based services, that your income doesn't hinder them from getting access to them or that your, your spouse doesn't have to spend down in order for you to access the services that Need. Mm -hmm. That's definitely those two components we expect to be part of whatever comes together. But the idea of um, paying family caregivers, spouses, others is definitely something that's being contemplated. And um, generally also making sure that maybe there's respite supports and other services. Um, that's kind of what we expect to see as the kind of policy starts to come together. Great, thank you. Um, some additional questions around the, the guidance that was uh, released around how states should handle the FMAP. Um, and then obviously later on, obviously once it's passed, uh, fingers crossed around infrastructure monies. Do you have any, any thoughts on that or any, any place where people can access some of that information around the guidance? Um, sure, so you're talking about the guidance that CMS put out around yes. this American Rescue Plan Act funding. Um, that uh, guidance came out on May 12th with 30 days for states to put together a spending plan, which obviously we're coming up on quickly. They did announce about a week after that that states could request an additional 30 days. Um, so it, you should definitely be paying attention to what your state's mm -hmm. doing with that funding. I know um, I've looked at California's plan. It's huge. It puts $5 billion additional dollars into home and community-based services, among other things. And so... Um, the, the guidance we think is pretty strong. Um, it provides, uh, while the funding, the year worth of funding, it provides some additional leeway um, for states to actually spend the money for an additional two years. Um, so we're hopeful that given that leeway, um, it'll, again, kind of, hopefully this, this um, ARPA funding will help the, uh, as a glide path to, to um, use the $400 billion in a really good way for states. Thank you. You're getting a lot of kudos from the audience. I'm just going through the list here. So thank you very much, Nicole. I haven't, and we, I may have asked this already, but I'm just going to ask it again, just clarify, because I see this a couple of times, clarifying that HCBS provides custodial care or would it also provide home health care, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. it, both. Yeah, both. Um, home health is definitely, home health is technically a service that is mandatory in some of Medicaid right now, but home health. So when we're talking about the workforce, we're talking about 
if you talk about the workforce, it kind of helps define the services. So workforce, it would certainly include home health. It would include personal care attendance. It would include, um, uh, you know, day, day programming. It would include residential supports. So it would include all of those services. Um, great, thank you. Um, just, I think we've answered a lot of these. And just How much does the HAA do to promote rebalancing efforts? Does it pull from any state's efforts to rebalance? Um, sure, so um, the HCBS Access Act should do nothing but yeah. assist with rebalancing efforts. And for folks that aren't familiar, the idea of rebalancing is, is moving away from institutional services and into community services. And it shouldn't really take away from any of the good things that states have already done, because the reality is that even in some states, let's say they've done a lot to rebalance and move the aging population into the community in those same states, people with IDD may still be at like an 80% institutionalization rate. So um, this additional funding should do nothing but support states in where they need to kind of like put some specific targeted funding. Um, and you know, it might be true that states that have further to go might be able to access some additional funding, but fundamentally it's gonna impact all people the same because it will mean that people can grow, can move and, and not have to worry about um, their services. Also, it would, it would eliminate waivers altogether. Um, it would mean there was, you know, one set of services and states could always add on to it, but there wouldn't be a 1915 mm -hmm. BC JKI 1115 gobbledygook that makes it complicated, obviously for um, individuals to navigate, but frankly, it's complicated for all of us too. Yes, that goes without saying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I saw a really interesting question. Just uh, for individuals who may not qualify for Medicaid um, and who suffer from a condition or chronic illness or a disability and their desperate need of services, do you have any recommendations? I know this is really focused on Medicaid, but I saw that question a couple times. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's that's hard because Medicaid does have these really strict income and asset limits, and that's. I will say that there are some on the fringes pieces in the HCBS Access Act that at least start to touch on that. Um, but you know, there are obviously some states do have Medicaid buy-in programs, but those are those can definitely have limitations. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I knew some magic answer, but but what I will say is that we're working on that because um, because Medicaid is really it. We're work also working on developing something an, as an alternative. So as I mentioned, as I mentioned when I was talking about the healthcare reform pieces, um, it's likely that if we see something like that move, we'll also see some sort of other LTSS, a so long-term service and support mm -hmm. benefit outside of Medicaid because we do recognize that there are plenty of people who don't qualify for Medicaid, whether it's based on level of need or financial um, restrictions. And so um, we've also been working with uh, other groups and leaders on, and legislators on how to um, do something outside of the Medicaid program. So definitely that's on the horizon. I wish I had a magic answer right this minute. What I will say is that there's precedent for it because the Affordable Care Act, when it did pass, included something called the Class Act, which would have provided a small cash benefit to, to um, support people with their for their LTSS needs. The same people who worked on that legislation are working on getting something similar. And so I really do think that that has a strong chance moving forward in the coming years, hopefully. And a lot of the same people who knew about that are now in the Biden White House. So again, hopefully that helps to kind of um, make all this work because we know that our while our ultimate goal for Medicaid is the HCBS Access Act, that's not the end. We need to have something outside of Medicaid. We also need mm -hmm. to fix the Medicaid buy-in program. No, the work's just never done, but <laughs> eventually we'll get there. Thank you. And I also want to add for anyone uh, listening, uh, our, we have a process, we operate the Paralysis Resource Center. So feel free to contact us. Uh, we can put you in touch with the information specialist. Uh, we, we, we can assist anyone with a mobility impairment uh, caused by any condition or not just spinal cord injury. So uh, please contact us, reeve.org. So for that person out there, uh, perhaps we'll be able to connect you with some state resources as well. So I know lots of organizations 
um, also have resource centers as well. So please don't hesitate to contact us. See what if we can help. Um, okay, they just keep coming, Nicole. You have more time? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Let's see. Uh, does the HCBS include services for funding behavioral therapy services for all individuals with behavioral problems or other disabilities? If so, what funding is available for individuals who aged out of Medicaid or do not qualify for Medicaid waivers? Um, I guess this is for questions for over 21, um, but that shouldn't really matter, right? They should still be able to qualify for Medicaid. Yeah, so um, uh, behavioral okay. health, uh, it's tricky because um, behavioral health isn't covered right now in terms mm -hmm. of um, HCBS broadly, but behavioral health was included in the definition of HCBS that we used in the American Rescue Plan Act funding. So there is some limited funding that's flowing in. It's certainly something that we're working on making sure that we're using a broad enough definition to include those supports for individuals with, with mental health and other behavioral health needs. That's definitely something that we're working on. Um, and the services that the under 21, over 21, that might be um, around uh, what supports and, and services are provided by, in the schools. And um, mm -hmm. that those aren't guaranteed if you're outside of the education system, if you're in a state, for example, that has a waiting list. Um, but it's something that we're constantly working on and making sure that we're being inclusive of the workforce. For example, peer support specialist is a very, that's a very specific workforce that works with the behavioral health population. And so making sure that we're not inadvertently leaving certain individuals out or certain populations out is something we're definitely trying to be cognizant of. And most importantly, the offices are trying to be inclusive of, which we saw with ARPA. So that's a, a good start. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And could you remind individuals, I know, of course, uh, the Reef Foundation has an advocacy, uh, online advocates, as well as the ARC, very strong. Uh, could you remind everybody who are the main champions on, on Capitol Hill, really supporting these efforts? Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, they, and I should have mentioned that actually, that was, that's, uh, that was an oversight on my part. So for the HCBS Access Act, um, and this is, answers kind of all the questions, but for the mm -hmm. HCBS Access Act, the sponsors are um, Senators Brown, um, Brown from Ohio, Hassan from New Hampshire, and Casey from Pennsylvania. And Senator Casey is a huge champion of disability mm -hmm. issues. And then um, Representative Dingell from Michigan. Um, and Representative Dingell and Senator Casey are the ones that introduced the language, the HCBS language that ultimately got put into the ARPA, the 10% FMAP bump. And they're also the offices that are leading on um, developing the legislation that's gonna, that's gonna carry the $400 billion. Um, but in addition, obviously the offices that are really important are um, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, um, as well as the committee level, Representative Pallone from New Jersey and um, Senator Wyden from Oregon. Um, that's great because we also received some comments about individuals uh, really struggling to access services in rural areas. Um, so we should also be contacting all our members who live in those states as well, because um, this yeah. person just saying like, it's really hard for folks to drive so long to get to uh, the person they're assisting or working with. Yeah, and a lot of that too, I mean, we need to make fixes so that things like mileage can be charged for, but you also have to, a lot of that is pay, right? You're not gonna have capacity in any given area if the pay rate is too low. Mm -hmm. And that's why we fundamentally need to get to the root of the direct care workforce crisis. And so I, I saw the questions around the, the rural piece and geographic inequities is definitely a problem. Um, also, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but something that I should say and point out that is, is specifically called out in the HCBS Access Act is around racial disparity when mm -hmm. it comes to access to services. Um, and obviously, there's, there's clear racial components. The direct care workforce is made up prim primarily of women of color. And so there's a lot of these pieces, whether it's geographic um, or racial equity, that we really have to look at. Yeah. Um. Just, there, I, you've been so generous with your time. So I just, this last question then, um, sure. would you be able to advise a website or database to find existing information on the laws, programs, or regulations by state that exist on person focused plan funding for services like HCBS? Example being how far can Medicaid funding go to pay for home-based services? Sure. 
Um, that's a, oh yeah, that's a good question, but it's a big question. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I can't think of a database that has that specific information. I mean, there's an there's a um, hcbsadvocacy.org um, has some really specific information, but it's broken down by state around the, the home and community-based service settings rule, which is the rule that requires funding to go specifically to home and community-based services that came out in 2014. So you might wanna take a look at that. I would also, I always um, point people to Kaiser uh, because they have state level, um, they have state level spending. CVPP or the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities also has some pretty good data around um, where funding is going. Um, but as far as kind of like, well, and I mean, honestly, you can Medicaid.gov, every mm -hmm. state, like if I'm ta I talked about the six states that have that community first choice option plan, the, all of those plans and, and the waivers are, are on the website. So you actually can find it relatively. I don't usually send people to like government websites as a good thing, but they actually are really easy to navigate. Um, and so that, that can be something else that uh, you can do. Um, so just, just a thought, but again, to just to kind of like give a few like last words, I would really just encourage, you don't have to be an expert on anything other than your own situation and your mm -hmm. own story in order to educate people about this issue. Um, and uh, I'm you know always available for questions. I wanna thank everyone. It's really nice to see the feedback. I, I, I do try to break things down uh, because mm -hmm. I do think it's really important for everybody to have a base level of understanding. But again, you don't even need to have that in order to be a really strong advocate. Um, and so thank you for taking the time to join us today. And thank you, Kim and the Reeve Foundation for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who attended and all your questions. We'll be sending out the recording along with the slides. And um, we, we are just so grateful. So thank you. And we'll to continue our advocacy and updates. And so I hope everyone stays well. And thanks again, Nicole. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.